My friends, the great experiment. Strange new world. Head trick. Would you look at that? The greatest trick. Welcome to Greatest Trek. It's a new Star Trek podcast from the makers of The Greatest Generation. Back in your earphones again for the second time in one week. I'm Ben Harris. I'm Adam Pranica. Yeah, that makes three total, right? Three ups this week. This is what people get when they support Maximum Fun and our show, right? It's like a team that's agile enough that cares enough Mm -hmm. we are up on a fucking saturday morning we could be spending time with our families yeah yeah we could be we could still be on vacation in my case i could be collecting korok seeds which is the only thing i care about in the entire world yeah you could obviously be doing that i could be having jazz gummies off the coast of big sur looking at the seals out there wait did you really end your vacation early yeah I'm back, wow. baby. I didn't really put that together. I thought your out of office was like ending on Friday, but that's wild, man. Thank you for doing that. If I had thought there was a chance this would have happened, I would have brought gear with me, but I didn't think there was a single chance. And not only that, if I had brought gear, no one's got internet or phone out there. You and I could barely communicate while I was yeah. out there anyway. <laughs> I was like really nervous that you were mad at me. I wrote like the first draft of the thing that you've heard on the beginning of episodes about the strike and I sent it to you and Wendy and Wendy replied pretty quickly and you just did not. For days, because I never saw it. And I was like, is Adam on the side of the AMPTP on this one? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, that would be an unexpected heel turn, but no, yeah, I just didn't get it. Yeah, It's so weird. Like I was out there and my wife and I aren't good at unplugging completely. And we wanted to watch a show out there, a show we'd been watching. And having not done the download before getting out there, like I started the download. And when you don't even see the clock dial of download even move, you're really in the sticks at that point. Oh, man. I've been there many times. It's an uncomfortable place to be. Yeah. Are you in... Any type of relationship jail, W slash R slash T, worth getting in the way of a vacation? (laughs) No, not really. It was not a huge difference to make it back as early as we did versus what we had planned. So I'm glad. And also an understandable situation. Look, I think you and I both know the relationship jail where it was a mistake of our own making is a very different sort of jail than surprise release of episode not your fault not my fault shit happens this is a jail i can break out of i am really glad to hear that i could see that being a disappointment big enough to make a wife very upset with you or or i if (laughs) she's a podcast wife she understands long suffering Uh (laughs) uh-huh yeah well hey I got a baby shower and a baby's first birthday to go to today. Wow. Wow. And I got stuff this evening as well. I got a very full plate. So why don't we uh, jump right into this one? It does no one any good to squeeze the heart of this Marin to keep it pumping. (laughs) Let's just let it go, Ben. It's Strange New Worlds, season two, episode eight, Under the Cloak of War. You know the greatest danger facing us is an irrational fear of the unknown. Let's fly. Uncertainty. It's an Uber mission, Adam. Good times, great oldies. We're picking up an ambassador, taking that ambassador to another place. Can I just ask right off the top, is the Kelsey May the ugliest Federation starship we've ever seen? My God, that really takes that sphere and nacelles design that Beverly was the captain of. Yeah. And Yep. Rockets that up to like the middle of the Starship Design power rankings. This fell out of the Utopia Planitia tree and hit every branch on the way down, right? (laughs) Have I said that before? That sounds familiar. I don't know. Ugly ship. Yeah, not a great looking ship. I'm sure the ship is fine. I'm sure the ship has qualities that people admire. But when you first get the Kelsey May up on the view screen, that's tough. Who is Kelsey May? I looked this up and I couldn't find an answer. 
there's like a photographer. You watch, Kelsey May is like a great person that they're doing this in honor of, and we're just like shitting all over the relative beauty of the ship. Yeah, and Kelsey May looks like that. The ship looks like Kelsey May, and <laughs> Kelsey May is a great person. <laughs> <laughs> you wish you had a friend like Kelsey May. <laughs> Maybe because you're so fucking judgmental of ships based on their appearance, that's why you don't have a friend like Kelsey May. I'll say it. I judge ships based on their appearance. I do. I'm that fucking shallow. Wow. We didn't even talk about how the Orion ship in that last mission was only ever sort of in soft focus in the background on the view screen in a way that? that I thought was really cool. Yeah. It was very shimmery. Anyways, this is the Prospero system, and the background of the Prospero system is that there are three inhabited planets that were not doing great with each other in the aftermath of the war with the Klingons, and the Federation has just recently patched all of the gripes up through the efforts of a Federation ambassador named Tabunny Kaolvin. <laughs> When uh, the ambassador transports onto the ship, he asks Pike what the address is and what direction they're facing. <laughs> <laughs> this is Doc Ra, son of Raul. Uh huh. Wasn't Raul the name of the guy that went out the hurl in the nacelle a couple episodes ago? Oh, uh, they make sure to say no relation. Oh, they do. Okay, cool. <laughs> <laughs> Evidently, uh, things that whistle don't really exist in Klingon culture. He just loves the bosun's whistle, doesn't he? Yeah. He, he like asks for it and they're like, oh, we can't give that to you. That's like a pretty key piece of Federation material. You remember when you were a little kid and I don't know if your school was like this. It probably mostly had tennis rackets and shit, but like my music class <laughs> had like the little mini marimba and like shakers and like mm -hmm. the stick you rub on the other thing that makes the scrape sound. And uh -huh. then there was the wooden instrument that sounded like a train whistle. Oh, yeah. You remember that thing? I love that thing. I went to the gift shop at a train museum and got one of those when I was a kid. They can barely keep that thing in stock. I know. It's so great. When you're a fucking six years old boy and you're walking out of a train museum with a train conductor cap and a wooden whistle, that's about as good as life gets, right? I should have walked out into traffic after that. that that's, <laughs> that's as good as it gets for a kid. That, that was the high watermark <laughs> of your entire life. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so you can understand why Doc Ra is so fucking excited when he sees this whistle. Never seen anything like it. What is that peculiar device? There's a couple of glances around the transporter room when this guy shows up. That makes it seem as though this is going to be uh, socially bit of a rocky ride for Ra. He uh, is being offered a trip right to his quarters for the trip, but he would like a tour of the ship. And that is agreed to, but we cut up to a bridge where none of the officers present are expecting a Klingon to walk in. And Uhura and Ortegas are having a conversation. And I thought it was kind of interesting. Like, I think that the deal with the entrepreneur being a ship that was not in the war sort of forgives this in Uhura a little bit, but like she has to be conscious of the fact that she is a noob in Starfleet who is like one of the first classes to matriculate out of the Academy into a Starfleet full of people that just went through some fucking shit. Yeah. And Ortegas went through that shit. Ortegas blew a hole in the middle of the shit and then flew the ship through it. Right. And bears some scars from this war. Like Uhura is being idealistic and talking about what having an ambassador like Ra in the Starfleet diplomatic corps represents. And Ortegas remains very suspicious of what his motivations might be and is saying that shit out loud and talking about his curriculum vitae or uh, <laughs> what's curriculum mori, like his, uh, yeah. <laughs> his CV, but for death. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. How about this? I mean, 
he definitely heard the line about being the butcher of Jugal when Ra arrives on the bridge with his tour group. And it's bang, bang, right? Awkward in the transporter room, awkward on the bridge. He has to have some practiced reactions to shit like this in the way that Picard has practiced reactions to people telling him about their 359 experience. Right. He immediately changes the subject, lets it flow off his back like water off a duck and talks about how pretty the view is out the front of the ship and how much better Starfleet ships are than Klingon ships. And it's a bell he rings several times is thinking that like human culture and Starfleet culture is better than Klingon culture. There's footage of the Battle of the Binary Stars in the pre-roll of this episode, which may serve as our only depiction of the Klingon Federation war up to this point, right? Right. And that served to prepare me for the idea of what we might get this episode. I mean, the view of the war that we get in this episode is really different from the one we got in Discovery. Like, Discovery had a very different war experience than Mbenga and Nurse Chapel did. Right, right. So we're in the bar and grill where Spock and Mitchell are working on a cocktail recipe, or so it seems. Yeah, they're trying to synthesize Ractagino. Yeah. And they're like, you know, classic bit of like, oh, we got plenty of time to get this dialed in. And then the surprise inspection by Tabunny Olven <laughs> happens, like as Spock is uttering this. I love that canonically Radkagino comes in a vessel that looks this way. Yeah, <laughs> canonical communer rug yeah. from the 90s. <laughs> it's great. I like that it's got Spock all curious about Klingon culture. Like having started this project, Spock turns to Ambassador Rod and is like, man, like this just has me like really curious about the whole thing. And again, Ambassador Rod does this thing that really like denigrates his own people. Like, oh yeah, they're they're idiots. I'm stupid, you're smart. I was wrong, you were right. Yeah, it's really like an unsophisticated take. You would expect an ambassador to be a little more diplomatic. You wouldn't expect him to shit on his own side in order to achieve diplomacy, but that seems to be what this guy does. You're the best, I'm the worst. Uh, You're very good looking, I'm not attractive. I had a boss in my work study job in college and my boss was an immigrant from, not a country like we've been at war at, but like an immigrant from a country that he had a lot of really bad feelings about and would say comments like this all the time. Like Hmm. they have no culture. It's a piece of shit country. Like it almost seemed like part of his identity as a new American was in opposition to the place that he had left. Yeah. In a way that was really hard for me to like relate to because it's a, country and a culture that I'm very curious about and have always like really liked the small samples that I've gotten of its cinema and its cuisine and and stuff like a place I would love to visit. But I think that this is like a thing that sometimes people living outside of the culture they were born into adopt as maybe a comfort blanket or as a kind of way of instructing the people around them about like what their feelings are about that culture and place. Mm Mm-hmm. And Ambassador Ra, like, hits this gong a million times in this episode. Like, he never misses an opportunity to distance himself from the Klingons, the war, the things they did in the war, but also just, like, Klingon culture in general and, like, what Klingons get up to when they're getting up to stuff. An insulated vessel achieves two (laughs) goals. It keeps the liquid inside at the optimal temperature while also protecting the hand of the person drinking it. In a cold beverage context, this also prevents the buildup of beads of water on the outside of the vessel. An uninsulated vessel can be very dangerous. That red Kajino's over 200 degrees. You're gonna burn someone. What if he pours it on his crotch? Do you want a lawsuit like that on your hands? (laughs) Many people look at that as a story about how broken the American judicial system is, but if you watch the documentary Hot Rectagino, 
you'll find that it's actually an apt metaphor <laughs> for the ways that conservative assholes and corporations try and get us to use the civil justice system less. <laughs> I love this moment because when Rob burns his hand, you see that flash of anger just below the surface. Yeah. And I'm thinking, when is this going to come out? For real. <laughs> Pike's like, you know, for insurance purposes, I should probably take you to Six Bay. Like, <laughs> I know you're probably fine, Klingon warrior, etc. cetera. Mm -hmm. We live in an idealistic future, so there is a robust civil justice system in the Federation. I should probably take you to the very worst place with the very worst person to interact with so soon after the Klingon Federation War. Fortunately, there is another doctor present when they walk into Six Bay, and she is the one to provide the treatment to Ambassador Ra, but the bummer vibes go off the chart when Mbenga and Chapel see this dude walk in the front door. This is not the good time waffles Mbenga that we've gotten <laughs> for a season and a half. I don't know what I'm saying. He is really suffering here and I hate to watch him suffer. He collapses and grabs his chest. This is not just anxiety. This is a full-blown panic attack. This is PTSD. Yeah. I have been treated for PTSD, and I guess to some extent I'm still in it. And the way this was described to me is like when you are in a situation that affects you in this way, the part of your brain that makes the feelings that you have when it's happening doesn't like know what time it is or how close you are to the actual situation. Mm -hmm. So when you're in a thing that reminds you of it, it feels like you're back there. Like it feels yeah. like you're there again. And that's... Very much what Mbenga seems to be going through here. He's clutching his chest. He's like sweating. He is in a really bad way. And this is the end of the cold open. This is a, a pretty long cold open. And I thought it was so weird that they kept the Lower Decks animation style in the opening <laughs> sequence for this episode. Like it just felt like tonally kind of a weird, you know, kind of got the bends, like going back to the nacelle sucker joke, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Why go back for that? I don't know. <laughs> Is that just going to be what it looks like from now on? I think we should stick with it. So we come back and it is a flashback. We're on Jagal. This is uh, Chapel coming in under fire in a shuttle, arriving at her field hospital posting on Jagal during the war. There is something very familiar about this scene to a consumer of war films, the arrival at a war zone. Yeah, like in media war. Yeah, especially if you are not a warrior. Chapel, being a nurse, is not used to this sort of situation. And once on the ground, she's greeted by Commander Martinez, played by Clint Howard from the Corbomite Maneuver. Yeah. <laughs> Star Trek legend, snow globe artist, and right-wing weirdo. Do you think it's weird that he wants to be called Bunk in an episode that features an actor from The Wire? Oh, yeah, that is weird. To my knowledge, no one calls him Bunk after this, right? Yeah, I mean, he's like in the episode for this moment and then like not really much... Again, right? Chapel's like, I don't know. It's kind of a war zone. Is this really the time for like jaunty nicknames or whatever? <laughs> and there's like a 10 minute scene where he tries to explain the importance of like keeping it light where you can in a place yeah. so horrifying. We do a lot of bits around here. It's sort of gallows humor, but you know, like in the mash tent here, it's a lot of fun actually. <laughs> Joseph is who Chapel needs to meet next and uh you only see his feet first it's one of those things where she's just been like thrown in at the deep end and she's been promoted to head nurse and and he's like i'm kind of technically the chief medical officer but that's the guy over there and it just shows like two wet feet <sighs> and then suddenly walking wounded are being beamed in and they need to go stand at the transporter pad and start doing triage and 
These guys are fucked up. Oh my God. People just covered in blood that, you know, some people get beamed onto the transporter pad in a horizontal position. And this guy, Alvarado, is one such example. And Chapel and Mbenga are working on him. And we've learned that there's no organ regenerator. So there's not really much that they can do for Alvarado. So what Mbenga comes up with is let's put his pattern in the buffer and we will send him to a ship when at such time as a ship with an actual hospital facility on board is in orbit. This scene is so instructive because it places a character unfamiliar with the situation among people who aren't just familiar, but are almost oblivious to the dangers inherent in this, right? Like, Bunk is so flip about their circumstances earlier. He's like, yeah, eventually the Klingons are just going to fire on us and we're all going to be dead. Like, it's not just dark in scene. It's dark in attitude. And Chapel being new has not gotten on their level in that way. Things are still shocking to her in a way that aren't shocking to anyone who's been there for a while. She is only slightly more ready for this than for some reason Jake who is also there yeah. learning how to be a medic in a field hospital it's me Jake oh and surprise Chapel is going to be the lead nurse here so it's not just like <laughs> welcome to your new job welcome to being the boss of your new yeah. job congratulations head nurse Chapel meanwhile in the future Mbenga is journaling about Biobed 2 and how it has never really been right ever since their encounter with the Gorns and he's like doing some work on it when Pike pops into the six bay nominally to borrow a cup of sugar, but in fact to check on his friend who he knows is having some real feels about this Uber mission that they're on. The ingredient he's there to get is deadly in large amounts, but so is Mbenga. <laughs> <laughs> and Pike is there to see how much of him he can sprinkle onto this mission before people start dying. Yeah. The orders from Starfleet are that war veterans are being asked specifically to interact with Ra as a way of, like, I guess, getting used to the idea of a peaceful relationship with the Klingons being a part of a future that they will be living in. Isn't this such a classic boardroom idea? Like, this is the executive class not knowing what the labor class does at all like <laughs> what a shitty order this is mm -hmm. they're like and then we'll scan your likeness and pay you once and that'll be good forever how about new no? i think a lot of the burden of this information is carried by episodes earlier when we're in those scenes with robert april and we're made to understand that the Federation cannot fight a war on two fronts. Peace with the Klingons must be maintained because of the Gorn's threat. There is no line from this episode drawn back to those, but you really need to remember that for the logic of this order to make sense, I think, because I don't think it does without that foreknowledge. They're really freaking out. Mbenga and Chapel, you know, are being specifically asked to be at this dinner at Pike's apartment later. Doesn't so much of this episode remind you of Star Trek VI in that way? Like, there's an uncomfortable dinner. There's also a piece being thrust upon characters uncomfortable with the idea. There's a lot of beats in here from Star Trek VI, I think. I see we have a long way to go. The war hangover is still affecting them. Yeah. You ever take some time to paint those war hangover figurines. <laughs> Stu does that a lot. I've never done that, but yeah, I, I know that Stuart Wellington is a big fan. <laughs> it's a lot of orcs and shit, like sleeping off a headache. Mm -hmm. You paint the figurine with black paint first and then white paint to like kind of accentuate all the little uh -huh. lines and, and details, and then you put the color on. Yep. <laughs> We flash back to this very harrowing surgery in the field hospital on Jagal, where Nurse Chapel and Mbenga are elbow deep in this guy's body. 
Turns out, Adam, this is an episode of uh, our sister show here on the Max Fun Network. We got this with Mark and Hal. <laughs> yeah. I love that episode they do where they decide what's the most important organ in the human body. <laughs> <laughs> we got this. There is a refrain this episode almost as often as incoming transport. It's, we got this. And it is something that serves to ground Chapel and Mbenga in the most terrible of times. Yeah. And uh, this is a literally like reach in and squeeze the heart rhythmically with your hand to keep this guy alive moment. And yeah. that's not the kind of medicine that they're used to because they're used to medicine where technology does everything for them. You'll be fine. Doc will wave a light over it. It's a scene that really shows that maybe the first casualty of war is innocence. Huh. I never heard that before. Yeah. Yeah. So with a memory like this rolling around in his head, Mbeka goes to this dinner and catches Ortegas outside Pike's quarters and they have a little conversation about like, hey, let's see if we can just kind of like put our trauma to one side so that we can snack on this delicious jambalaya that the captain made. Jambalaya? If you're going to bet which crew person is going to be the one to pipe up or to snap... Like, I had some confidence in Umbanga in tamping it down. I had some confidence in Chapel. I think Ortegas is the favorite to break, right? Yeah. Hey, remember some of those horrible things your people did? <laughs> it's always a bad sign when you stand up at the dinner table and then, like, just sort of stand there at attention. Right, yeah. Was that a ready-to-be-punished stand? <laughs> kind of. But definitely like sets a tone for the like Thanksgiving dinner with your shitty relatives. <laughs> yeah, it really feels like the fork throw scene in the bear. Like there's some real intensity to this. And like when Ortegas is invited to leave, it creates an opening for Mbenga to fill. Yeah, the idea is like, hey, maybe Chapel and Mbenga, just to pull two names out of the air, could go check on Ortegas and make sure everything's okay. And, and yeah. maybe the three of you can get calm together. Yeah. I mean, this does better for Chapel than Spock was able to do on the other side of the room. Like, he's flailing. He's fighting for his life right now with Chapel because he sees a problem that he wants to fix. And this is not something that he can. And their relationship has been put in a really weird space ever since the previous episode. So like the, what can I do to help you? I don't know how to help you energy that he's bringing is especially disquieting for her. Like it's almost making it worse that he's trying to help, you know? Spock is battling on two fronts. Like he's trying to feel what emotions are like. He's trying to figure out what their practical uses could be in this case with the one person he can't afford to fuck up that experiment with, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So we get another flashback of Mbenga doing his rounds and talking to the now recovering heart massage patient, talking to this guy about what he's been through and what this war is like. And then this Andorian, like, special ops guy named Trask comes and tries to recruit Mbenga into a mission. Put down your scalpel and your stethoscope. Pick up your knife and come do a fucking ass-kicking mission with me. Or at least give me some of that green stuff, you know? Like, if, if, you, if you don't want to come yourself. Green juice that Mbenga actually invented. Wow. How about that? <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, he worked at a Jamba before he was in uh, Starfleet Special Ops or whatever. Yeah. Yeah, this guy Trask, missing an eye on one side. I feel like uh, we've met a lot of Endorians that have like lost a key facial feature uh -huh. or two. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the idea of assassinating Ra is floated as the mission here. By assassinating Ra, you'll end his reign of terror cut the head off of what's causing all of these problems. Ra is in charge of the whole Klingon deal here. So intelligence wants him taken out. Yeah. Back in the present, 
Ra is holding court. It looks like that moment after dinner where like no one's cleared the plate. You're yeah. just sort of chilling. Maybe you're having a little coffee or Ratcagino or whatever. Under the table, Adam's foot is just <laughs> bouncing up and down because the like the mess of it all is really fucking driving him up the wall, but he's trying to maintain for yeah. the like social energy. Yeah, exactly. Clean your mess. The subject of Jagal comes up and uh Hey, Mabenga and Chapel were there, right? And Rod tries this like, yeah, I had a terrible experience in Jagal too. Like that's going to comfort them or something. <laughs> the stolen victim valor of this feels totally unjust. Ra is not the victim here. And to yeah. claim it, it feels like a slap in both of their faces for him to claim that, right? Yeah. It's sufficient to make Ortega's crack. Yeah. So this really sends Ortegas and winds up getting all three of the war veterans out of the room because Chapel and Omega are sent after her. And this is I thought was really good. Like like I think Ra is like he's an interesting character because he's a diplomat and he's supposed to be very good at that, but he is like completely misreading the room here. Or if he isn't, like, I'm not quite sure what his goal is. Pike is very aware that he has three officers in a huge degree of distress and is, like, trying to help Mbenga get out of a space that he does not feel safe in. And when Mbenga walks past Ra, Ra grabs his arm and is like, hey, man, like, we should do some Klingon karate together. I hear you're really good. Oof. This moment is so charged. I think... The casting of Robert Wisdom is really great here because, like, he is absolutely covered in loaf. But there's something inherent in him. Like, the leadership quality of his performance, like, that made him such a great Bunny Colvin. Like, there's a little bit of Bunny in Ra. Yeah. Yeah. I do hate him because he's a monster, but it makes it difficult to hate him completely. Right, because he's a charismatic monster. Bingo. We need to score a lot of black fast. Licensed businessmen. Hey, uh, cheaters don't deserve nothing in Latinum. So we flash back again, and it's a reminder that in Star Trek, every weapon is a tracer, right? <laughs> that night sky is being absolutely lit up. Jigal seems to always be kind of nighttime or dusky, right? It really reminded me of the moon scene in 2001. Like, no matter how much light was there, it was still very, very dark. Yeah. This uh, heart massage patient is kind of taking in all of these trace arounds. This also reminded me of that scene in Sicario where they go up on the roof mm -hmm. and look into Ciudad Juarez at night, and it's just, like, absolute mayhem. Right. And he is, like having this existential crisis of like I joined Starfleet because I wanted to like explore and be a scientist and I'm a fucking soldier now. What have I gotten myself into? I got soul, but I'm not a soldier. Some of my favorite scenes in Star Trek are where characters describe what Star Trek is or <laughs> like what the Federation's purpose is. And I really liked Mbenga's way to describe it. It reminded me a lot of Bruce Greenwood's Christopher Pike when he described what Starfleet was to Kirk in the first Abrams Star Trek movie. Because he's saying like, you know, that is ideally what we do, but we also sacrifice ourselves so that the people that come after us can do that. And yeah. if we don't stop the Klingons here and now, then that stops existing for everyone. It's Unusual because Mbenga has some visual aids and he sort of describes it as a domino effect. Mm. Like if Jakal falls and then that domino hits another moon and then another and another and then before you know it, all of the moons are under Klingon control. And then what do you have? No freedom. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, the black ops people under... Trask are getting ready to go on their mission to take out Ra and Mbenga and Chapel are talking about how they're going to send some frontline troops to this other place as a distraction for 
the special ops guys. And it turns out heart massage guy is one of those troops. He's heading for the meat grinder and Mbenga is trying to find a way to spare him basically a death sentence mission that he's being sent on. And the pep talk that he had with him earlier really worked too well. This guy's like, no, man, I'm a soldier. Like, this is my duty. I got to do this. I've got to go get killed by that booty. You know me. This guy makes a really strong case because he's like, yeah, you say a lot of things when your chest is cracked open and a nurse is pumping on your heart. He's like, <laughs> yeah, you do. I bet yeah. you do. Yeah. Good thing he's wearing kind of a flak jacket style uniform, though. I got to believe his chest is pretty tender Oh yeah. after what he's been through. Although red as a color, maybe not what I would want to wear into the thick of battle. Yeah, but like that shade of red looks so awesome. Yeah, it I does. think he really looks great. So we flash back forward to the entrepreneur and we're in a corridor with Spock and Chapel. And it's that thing where she's feeling bad and he wants to help. And it's very human nature to try to want to like fix something that may be hurting someone else. It's very human boyfriend nature. Like, oh, you're having a problem? Let me offer suggestions for how to solve it. And she's like doing that thing of like, you weren't in the war and the scars of that are going to be with me forever. Like the things I went through in Jigal are painful and deep and there's not really any way for me to like explain what I'm going through to you. And there's not really any way for you to solve that problem. It's interesting that like if Spock were intending to be more logical here, I think he may understand that like a person can't make a person feel a kind of way. The best you can do is like not make the situation worse. It really is demonstrative of how far in the human emotional direction he's gone and has been. I guess Boimler really fucked him up. Yeah, I think so too. Chapel needs some time. And by the time Chapel says the last word in that statement, Spock is already down the corridor. I understand. You require personal time away from me. We get another flashback of the people coming back from this mission. And it's both the people in the Black Ops group who failed and also the people that were sent into the meat grinder the heart massage patient buys it trask buys it like basically this is a giant catastrophe everybody that they sent to do this chop the head of the snake off mission bought it and you know they're trying to do that triage thing and there's something wrong with the transport and they wind up having to delete alvarado's pattern in order to get back more people that they have a better chance of saving. Like it's Mbenga that pushes the button, but I think that that's like the real moment for Chapel that hurt the most and why this scene is here. It's like, it's serving to underline what she said to Spock in the previous scene, like how bad Jagal was for her. That idea that that pattern is in that buffer is a thing that her character is holding on to as a tiny bit of hope. And when Mbenga has to push that button to bring more people in so that they can do more triage it really shatters her i'm really liking jess bush more and more episode after episode with how she's able to convey the pain of this moment wordlessly the idea that this scene occurs largely without dialogue until the end i think is its strength and the efficiency with which mbanga describes the reasoning Like, he saved lives. I thought was just a phenomenal way to put it. Zero sugar, zero fat. All protein, baby. Yeah. The needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few. Or the one. I think the one thing about this scene that didn't work for me was that the button sounded like a bubble craps button in a casino. (laughs) 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 Like... Constantly asking you to hit the button. Like, the button shouldn't have an opinion here. 
Yeah, and then when they do push it, it makes that same your toast is ready sound that we talked about in the previous episode. Yeah. Yeah, it's weird. Alvarado's in there. If we push the logs, he'll die. I... Push the button! Come on! <laughs> Pattern deleted. So in the dojo, Ra and Mbenga have their throwdown, and it's a pretty even match. Like, despite being a person who uses a cane as a mobility aid, Ra is still pretty able to throw down when he's in the dojo. You get the sense in the scene that part of what Mbenga is going through is just sort of like disbelief that Ra is able to be not haunted by the past. Mm -hmm. That both goes to establish what a monster Ra actually is, but also... Like jealousy is probably not exactly the right word, but I think that Mbenga is feeling especially shitty about the way he is feeling in the context of this guy that did worse shit and has more to feel bad about, just like walking around seeming to be totally fine. This scene really fucked with my expectations because I expected a couple of things that didn't happen here. I thought Mbenga would finally lose control and maybe even kick this guy's ass. That doesn't happen. I thought maybe Mbenga's strategy would be to peel that onion of Ra and maybe get him to break. And that seems to be the attempt through dialogue, and that doesn't happen. Babs was at Star Trek Day last year, and at least when I saw him, no one was chatting him up, and I think that's because... He didn't really have a lot of action in the first season, and I don't think a lot of people really knew what his deal was. I really regret not talking to him because he seems so fucking interesting. Yeah. He goes super deep in this episode. Yeah. For Mbenga and Nurse Chapel, this is a towering episode in terms of yeah. the performances and what it means for their characters. Ra sees Mbenga as potentially like a tool to add to his kit. Like, he's pitching him on, like, hey, like, you know, we fought on opposite sides of that thing. Like, we could go around to peace conferences and, like, really, we could really do stuff, man. Isn't that part of the frustration with that character, though? It's like, yeah, I get you're trying to do good, but don't fucking ignore all of the history. Like, you can't just ignore it. And Benga knows Ra's dirty secret and yeah. has to shower that secret off of him. Yeah, because he's like pushing Ra on this and Ra's like, oh yeah, like the things that were done to civilians and children and stuff by the Klingons really horrified me. And that's like, I became the butcher of Jugal because I killed all of my lieutenants to punish them for doing all this bad shit. And that's like the last thing they talk about before their little sparring match breaks up. And yeah, Mbenga has basically a second PTSD sesh in the shower. Computer. Set sonic shower to fall. This is where you get a little more detail about some of the atrocities that took place in this war zone. Yeah. Civilians being killed, children being killed. We get a scene inside of a morgue full of corpses and makes you wonder, like, what's it going to take to activate Mbenga's dark skills? And uh, when he grabs that Klingon knife, the dick tag... <laughs> We have our answer, right? Guess so, yeah. That, that, that is now your chair, Captain. Oh, so Una is trying to manage the morale of the ship, which she has noticed has gone off a cliff. And she, like, unprompted shows up in Pike's office with a new course charted that will get Ra the fuck off this ship a lot quicker than previously planned. But she's like, you always wonder that when you're in the back of a cab. Like, is this the fastest way, really? Yeah, here we are, like, sawtoothing our way <laughs> through block after block. Why don't we yeah. just make some straight lines? Yeah. Pike is persuaded by this. And we go back to the past where Mbenga goes on this rouge mission to try and do what Trask failed to. Before leaving, he uh, gives a little bit of green juice to Chapel and says, like, you know, if and when the Federation line falls, just, like, drink one of these and use it to save yourself because uh, that's the only thing that's going to. 
I mean, having seen what the green juice does to people, I think that's a kinder read than what I had on it, which was like, take this green juice and kill as many of these motherfuckers as you can before getting killed yourself, you know? Chapel seems down. Yeah. Chapel's hard as hell by this moment in time. Like, she has hardened to the situation. And so off he goes, and back in the present, Ra comes and visits Mbenga in Six Bay. And Mbenga's like, hey, man, like, I'm not into your, like, team up and go ride for peace scheme that you're pitching me on. Like, I just want you to get the fuck out of here. I want you to leave me the fuck alone. Get the fuck out! Do you think Ra has a death wish here? Because I watched the scene a couple of times and I'm like, what are you even doing there, man? Oh, I'm so sad. My trip's getting cut short. No one wants to hang out with me. Why do you think that is? The one person who knows exactly why? The sort of false modesty of this? I think, crucially, Rod does not know who the Butcher of Jugal is. Bingo. And he should have, because... It is the person up whose tree he is barking. Yeah. And boy, this scene is very interesting to me because it starts very slow and it's, you know, it's Mbenga like just trying to set boundaries and Ra kind of ignoring and stepping over those lines and Mbenga keeping his cool. The tension of like, you don't know what I know, like one character knowing all of the information and one character not. And that being teased out is excellent. And just kind of casually flipping over the top of the pelican case that the dick tag is in is this very intentional moment. So Mbenga reveals that he is in fact the person that killed all of Ra's lieutenants. And Ra's like sob story about being horrified by the atrocities committed by the Klingons is bullshit. And that stuff all was done at his orders. It's stolen horror. Yeah. And then the scene where they fight being framed from behind the frosted glass. Like you just see it in shadow, basically. Yeah. So we have Chapel seeing this first person. She's the only person that sees what happens really. But I think the episode is implying, specifically implying through the fact that Mbenga like got the dick tag ready to go a few beats earlier in the scene, that Mbenga is like extrajudicially executing Ra in this moment. If you aren't sure during or in the scene after, you're definitely sure in the scene with Pike and Mbenga in the very end, right? Yeah, but that choice to show the action from the other side of the frosted glass, leaving the thinnest little G-string of plausibility to Mbenga's story is very interesting to me as just a directorial decision. Robert McNamara coined the phrase, the frosted glass of war. Right. And that's what you see here. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, raw dead. RSVP raw. People need saints but not that type of saints during chapel's interrogation what did you make of how sure she was of the answer she was giving it's one thing to be certain in your testimony if we're going to call it that does she know she's covering for him i think she does i I think think she does too she and and amenga are without having had a conversation about it, in total agreement about what needs to happen to Ra for things to be right. Yeah. What didn't have to happen was like that entire shelf full of urine samples to be like dropped on Ra's body afterwards. Right. Yeah. And then the shelf of fecal samples. Who keeps those things so close to the middle of the six bay? Out in glass jars? Like, why? I don't understand. But uh, the use of this knife, very, very, very smart by Mbenga because this knife has the DNA of the other Klingon warlords 
from Jagal. So the knife was the property of the butcher of Jagal, and everybody knows that Ra was the butcher of Jagal. So yep. it's a, oh, Ra must have gotten stabbed by his own knife when he went after Mbenga is the conclusion everybody arrives at. It's the perfect crime. Oh, I see. Then everything is wrapped up in a neat little package. Pike definitely has space open in his mind for the possibility that that's not exactly what happened and goes down and sort of opens the door to Mbenga to say, like, what really went down. And Mbenga lies right to Pike's face. Yeah, he sure does. I love that when Pike walks away, the framing of Mbenga in profile allows more screen behind him and not mm -hmm. in front because visually we're seeing his past in the composition. Yeah. yeah. It appears as though his future is in question because we can't see in front of his face that way. That conversation that they have about second chances and Starfleet believing in the ideal of second chances as opposed to justice for the victims and and Benga saying like, you have the privilege of being idealistic because mm -hmm. you didn't experience Jigal is really interesting. I mean, I think that um, the couple of times I've like been in a situation where a police report was filed. Like I had an experience when I was in my 20s. I lived in a ground floor apartment and a guy who was like, probably on something and was having a bad night, decided that whatever was going on inside my apartment was very interesting to him. And my then girlfriend, now wife, and our female roommate and I were in this apartment while he was tapping on our window with a knife mm. and saying threatening things to us. And Was we, it a dick tag? It wasn't quite that big, uh -huh. but you know, like... There were all these like victim services things that were made available to us. It was solved before anything went out of hand. And I don't know exactly what happened to the guy, but it's one of those things where you like, well, like nothing actually happened. And I don't want this like probably one bad night to ruin a guy's entire life. Then again, it's not okay to fucking make people feel unsafe in their own home the way he did. Sure. And the tension between those two feelings, like, I don't think that this should, like, change the course of this guy's entire existence if this was a bad night, but also he can't do that and it's, like, not okay, is something that feels almost impossible for me to resolve. And it's very interesting to me that Pike and Mbenga are kind of set up on opposite sides of a tension like that, where Pike really rides for, we should let him have a second chance and... Mbenga knowing better. He knows that this guy isn't a person who was horrified by the excesses of his lieutenants and killed them so that he could escape. He fucking did the bad thing. He was the monster. Yeah. That experience with the guy with the knife, the reason I've never been able to resolve that is like, I don't really know that guy. I don't know what that guy's fucking deal is. Mm -hmm. I don't know if he's actually a monster or if he was just high out of his mind and drunk and in a bad way. But you don't need to know that to know that that person is wrong. Right. I just don't know if he's like deeply intrinsically wrong or was wrong in that moment, you know? And right. so like, I can't have the kind of self-assuredness that Mbenga has. Well, you didn't kill him like yeah. Mbenga did. So yeah. not that I know of anyway, not that you've admitted. No, I wouldn't admit that here yeah. for sure. But uh, yeah, as far as Uber missions for the Starship Enterprise goes, this one is a one star, no tip kind of situation. <laughs> Mbenga's log ends the episode. He's getting that bio bed working again. He's got a fucking sexy as hell black fest toolbox that he keeps his <sighs> kid in. Yeah. Holy shit. It's like bio bed two is a metaphor. Metaphor. This bio bed won't work indefinitely. It needs regular maintenance. Mm -hmm. And that's what Mbang is there for. Because it's the bio bed the ship deserves. <laughs> but not the one it needs right now. <laughs> so Mbenga will fix it. Because he's got the tools in that fucking dead sexy black festival box. Did you like this episode, Ben? She'll always bring it home. After 
Season two, episode seven, those old scientists. This episode fucking shocked me. I felt like I had the bends. I couldn't fucking believe what a dark, brooding, complicated episode this was after an episode that had its moments of real pathos, but was ultimately funny and silly and a romp. And I think that this show is really amazing for being able to have the kind of range that episodes seven and eight represents. Yeah, I don't think we were meant to watch episode seven and episode eight in the same sitting the way we did. I rewatched this one at 7.30 a.m. this morning, and it was tough going. This is a really tense, really stressful episode at times. Mm -hmm. And um, I think in talking about it with you, it's clear I've been thinking a lot about things that have happened to me in my life a lot in the context of this episode. Mm -hmm. And I think in that way, like this episode is sticking with me in a way that not a lot of Star Trek episodes do. So I think it's a superlative episode, but not the funnest to watch. Yeah, I think it's the strongest episode of the season, if not the series, to me. I thought it was just astounding. In Star Trek as a place terms, this was a contemporary war film grafted onto a Star Trek story, and it hit extremely hard in that way. It went, like, fully dark in a way that, like... You remember how people rejected Star Trek Into Darkness for its version of darkness and war? Yeah, because that was kind of nihilistic. In a way that this wasn't. Like, this episode got it right. Like, you yeah. can be dark, but you need to have substance to the darkness. And heart. Like, yeah. this is an episode with a ton of heart, despite how dark it is. Yeah, it made me think a lot about the attempts that Star Trek has made before without fully going there the way this episode did. And I want to call out the writer of this episode, Davey Perez. He was the writer of the Lotus Eaters episode, and that was another episode this season that I felt like the real pathos, like the real depth of human grief was apparent there. And I think there's something that that writer is able to tap into that made that episode and this episode specifically the powerful stories that they are. And uh, just really, really amazing work here. I think something that I'll want to rewatch, Babs Olasan McCoon and Jess Bush's performances here are maybe the most harrowing, the most dangerous feeling of the series. And just incredible work by them. Just really, yeah. really, really impressive and i mean i'm so glad they're a part of this cast they bring it every time yeah and similarly the guest appearance by robert wisdom i mean he's a fucking heavy hitter mm -hmm. and i think this is kind of like what you buy when you bring in someone like that like a character who from the moment we meet him feels super three-dimensional and complicated and intense and um, like we've been saying, this writer and these actors are not replaceable by some bullshit machine. The emotional work of presenting an experience like this on camera is really intense. And the idea that you just get paid that day and like, that's it yeah. is fucking bullshit. That completely ignores the costs associated to a person for making yeah. that happen. Emotional costs. And this episode will be with us as Star Trek fans for a long time. Like, we'll have this episode for as long as we are fans of Star Trek. And that deserves residuals, you know? <laughs> hey, let me ask a question. Do you think we're supposed to grieve for Ra at the end? Because so much of the attention is pulled from his death to the circumstances or the potential guilt mm -hmm. of Mbenga we almost turn the page on him immediately and don't really think about him anymore after. It's a good question. I think he is an interesting midpoint between like a character that is a monster. Like, I mean, when Mbenga says the thing about being glad that he's gone. He didn't kill his own lieutenants, but he did kill civilians and kids. So yeah. like he is a monster. He's a monster who I think sincerely wanted 
some kind of redemption. That's what I'm getting at with by asking the question is is like, are you able to believe that in him enough to feel any sort of sadness at his death? I think that the thing that seals it is that he is dishonest in how he goes about trying to get that redemption. And that's the thing that sort of makes him unredeemable to me. Do you think Chancellor Gorkhan had bodies sufficient to make his death the tragedy that it was depicted as Hmm. in the sixth Star Trek movie? Like he was clearly a war veteran. Like, yeah, he's nailed together. (laughs) I don't know. I was thinking about just a lot of things during this episode. Really, really thought provoking. Well, do you want to see if there's anything thought provoking in the priority one inbox? Oh yeah. Always, mostly, sometimes is. Priority one message from Starfleet coming in on secured channel. Well, this may just be a side effect of us jumping ahead in the uh, episode release pace. We only have one P1 today from Terry, and it is to me, you, and them. It goes like this. Wanted to say hey to Ben, Adam, and all FODs. It's more of a birthday gift to myself done on slash near the 9th of August. Ben and Adam, keep it up. Love hearing your thoughts on all the new Trek. You guys know my jam. All your stuff is gold. Cannot recall the exact reference, but when you did a cool hand Luke, he was smiling. I knew I'd be a listener for life. Thanks. God, that's really nice to hear, Terry. I so often forget the references that we make because they're just the vernacular of our show. Yeah. <laughs> like, I wish I could remember this specific reference to Cool Hand Luke that Terry is mentioning. Do you remember it? I don't. You know, it's early in the morning and I haven't had my three dozen hard-boiled eggs yet. So mm. <laughs> maybe it's just because of that. Like, I'm still a little bit groggy. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. That's got to be it. Well, thanks to Terry for supporting the show with a Priority One message. Yeah, and happy birthday, Terry. Yeah. If you'd like to support the show in the way Terry did, you can go to MaximumFun.org slash Jumbotron. Have us read your message, like we just did, on an episode of Greatest Trek. Hey, Adam. What's that, Ben? Did you find yourself an Edward Larkin? Edward Larkin! Oof. In an episode this bleak, who's having the most fun? It's not about fun. I think it's about expressing your purest feelings. <laughs> and for me, that's Ortegas. When Ortegas is the first at the dinner table to say the quiet part out loud, she's the first. And that takes some fucking stones. Yeah. And... For her to say her piece and then stand up and wait for the punishment, like, respect to her, big time. That's as close of a moment as I can see to uh, what would earn someone an Edward Larkin nomination. What about you, Ben? I think it's Ortegas. I think that, especially after the daggers that Pike stares at her, and I'm I'm not talking about dick tags, Adam. <laughs> When she gets caught, you know, with uh, Tabuni Olvin standing behind her talking about the butcher of Jagal. Mm-hmm. And uh, like she knows what she did. Everybody on the bridge knows what she did. And they kind of all pretend that nothing happened. But Pike gives her that dirty look. Yeah. That does not shake her off her convictions. And uh, I love that about Ortegas. Yeah. She is. Uh fast becoming a real favorite character on this show. Ortegas. Well, Adam, the last segment in any episode of Greatest Trek is the Warning Boys segment. Prepare a buoy and launch it when ready. Warning Boys. An emergency buoy. A warning buoy. I'm going to share a podcast review from Apple Podcast Great Britain today. Hey. This was cool. a review somebody left of Greatest Trek. Five stars, better rating than the Uber mission got today. So that's Mm -hmm. good. Title, a warning blah for anyone reading this. Subscribe to this pod. Subscribe your friends to this pod. (laughs) Wow. 
I like that the context of Warning Bois not given any explanation in that review. Like, I feel like that's exactly the tone of a Warning Bois. It's like, if you see that and you think that's a funny bit, you're going to get our show, you know? You know, back when we were first starting out, we were all about growing the audience in whatever means that was possible. And I remember one of the angles we took was like, Borrow your friend's phone and get them subscribed to the show. <laughs> yeah. That seems to be the spirit of this message. I like it a lot. Yeah. I'm looking forward to being inside of Great Britain doing our live show coming up soon. Me too. That's just around the corner. Oh, man. Can't and wait. Just a tight three-day trip for me to <laughs> London and back from LA. Wow. That is big business shit right there. I know. Well... We really appreciate everybody who uh, tuned in today and uh, we'll throw it over to Ryan Whedon, the editor of today's episode, who is doing a real quick turn on this edit. Huge thanks to our producer, Wendy Pretty, and to Ryan Whedon for um, being on call for these edits. We really, really appreciate the efforts of everyone at Expert Shibota for helping us deal with the fact that Star Trek doubled up on episodes on us this week as a surprise yeah <laughs> I think these uh, these came out really good me too and it's thanks to all the great help we get alright Ryan take it thanks Ryan Greatest Trek is an Uxbridge Shimoda podcast on the Maximum Fun Network it's hosted by Ben Harrison and Adam Pranica and produced by Wendy Pretty this episode was edited by Ryan Week. next week is season 2 episode 9 of Strange New Worlds it's called Subspace Rhapsody. Ben and Adam will have the network's logline for that at the end of Monday's Greatest Generation, and they'll be back in this feed next Friday with a review. Adam Ragusea composed all the original music for the show. He has a podcast and YouTube cooking channel, which you can find by searching for Adam Ragusea. Thanks to Nick Dittmore for creating the show art, and to Bill Tilly for managing the Greatest Trek social media accounts on Instagram, Mastodon, and Twitter. Follow those accounts and use the hashtag Greatest Trek when you talk about the show online. Thanks to all the Max Fund members who support the show financially. If you'd like to become a member, you can do so at MaximumFun.org slash join. And you can always show your support for free by leaving a five-star review on Apple Podcasts or by recommending the show to a potential new listener. Lastly, don't forget to visit Podshop.biz for all your Greatest Trek merch needs. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next week on Greatest Trek. Maximum Fun, a worker-owned network of artist-owned shows, supported directly by you.